Okay, uh, thank you uh, for joining me for today's virtual tour of the hospital. Uh, the summer is upon us and I would tip be typically welcoming, welcoming people into our gardens uh, for a tour in person. Unfortunately, this is not possible this year uh, due to the ongoing visitor restrictions to, uh, due to COVID-19, um, but we hope visitors will be able to return soon. Uh, but rather than dwell on what we can't do, um, let me tell you what we can do. Uh, in today's virtual tour, uh, I will be mining the archives to provide a historical uh, tour of the Royal Hospital and enlivening my presentation with modern photography of the hospital today. I hope to convey the long history of the hospital on this site and how the hosp hospital has continually adapted to provide specialist long-term care for its patients. The, host the hospital was founded in 1854 as the Royal Hospital for Incurables, adopting its uh, current name in 1995 and has resided in this space for 158 years. There's a lot of history to convey and this tour shall mainly focus on the early years of the hospital's existence. I'd like to begin by introducing, introdu introducing uh, those who may not be familiar with the work of the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. The hospital has, is situated in Putney Heath in Southwest London. It is an independent um, medical charity um, which provides care for people with complex neurological disabilities due to brain injury, illness, or neurological conditions. The hospital is split between two main services, uh, the brain injury service uh, for people needing complex rehabilitation or with prolonged disorders of consciousness and, and a specialist nursing home for people with complex physical disability and cognitive behavioral needs. The RHN archive uh, was established in 2018. Um, so yeah, a little bit of background about myself um, and what I'm doing in the hospital. So um, the archives was, was established in 2018 off the back of um, a survey undertaken by the National Archives in 2013, which described the collection which we had of national significance for the history of medicine and the history of disability in Britain. The aim of the service is to collect, preserve, and make publicly available the historical records of the hospital. Uh, this talk is made possible thanks to the generous support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, the RHN was awarded a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant in July 2019 uh, for a two-year heritage project to create a sustainable uh, public engagement program for the RHN's new disability history uh, archive. Uh, the project aims to open up and share our rich history with the wider community through a program of conservation, cataloging, digitization, and outreach events. Um, the project will provide first time access for, his, for the historical records of the hospital uh, to the local community and RHN supporters. And it is an ongoing project which was due to finish in November, but has now been extended due to the pandemic until uh, May 2022. So I'd like to begin the tour um, by um, where I would usually begin the tour if we were doing a tour in the grounds. So um, I'm beginning the, uh, the tour actually at the main entrance, which is the gatehouse to the hospital. The gatehouse is one of the oldest architectural features on site and dates back to 1788. As you can see from these images from a recently digitized uh, colored lantern slide from the 1890s, uh, little has changed in the subsequent years. Um, to the left of these men uh, is, by the hospital gates is a sign which reads, Royal Hospital for Incurables, supported by voluntary contributions. Whilst the hospital has had several names, it did not remove the term incurables from its official title until the late 1980s. And it's, it was not fully removed from the building until 1995. This term can be seen as offensive and dehumanizing, um, not only to modern sensibilities, um, it was regularly questioned throughout the hospital's long history. Uh, 
However, it is important to address the original context in which it was used. The, the origins of the name came from the hospital's Victorian foundations, where it was set up to be a home for people who were medically certified to have incurable disease. This was a broad and ill-defined, um, ill defined possibly as the medical profession did not want to dwell on patients which it could not treat. Typically, those with an incurable diagnosis had a complete or permanent disability, like paralysis, uh, rheumatic, rheum, rheumatic arthritis, or some cancers or diseases such as tuberculosis. Anything that prevented a patient from working or meant that they were, were required care. The hospital has recently um, digitized um, early case books of 10,000 people who applied uh, for relief from the hospital from 1854 to 1911. Um, and just an example um, of a little survey I did with the first 100 patients, um, the uh, variety of, um, of conditions, as you can see, uh, were primarily to do with sort of paralysis, rheumatic conditions, and spinal conditions, but also you, there were people who were applying with conditions which were we now would see as very much treatable in the community, such as epilepsy and unfor the unfortunate term idiocy, which was what the Victorians used uh, for learning disabilities. Um, The need uh, for a hospital for people with these chronic or long-term disabilities was partly due to the absence of support, either from a healthcare system or the state. The big teaching hospitals would not admit patients with incurable conditions, meaning that the medicine and care for such patients was often uh, based on private finance or charity. For those who, who were unable to access such support, the only recourse was through workhouse infirmaries some of which uh, did provide a good quality of care, but certainly not universally, um, not universal. And in, in class conscious Victorian society, uh, um, this, it was seen as a shocking, shocking fall for someone who was respectable. Um, it, yeah, respectable. Okay. Um, this could be seen with the admission criteria of the hospital, which was quite clear uh, up until the 1940s, that this was for the middle classes or for professionals uh, and not for people of the pauper class. This hospital then was founded in an attempt to fill this specific gap for patients who could not afford private care, but who were considered too respectable for the workhouses. Um, now, like the tour, we are going to if you could follow me now up the driveway, um, we will be passing some pink rhododendron bushes, which I've been told were a very old. Um, I have no information on that. And on the right hand side, uh, there's also some cherry trees. Um, I would also point out that there is a, um, a historic lamppost, which is actually listed, which unfortunately has um, a mirror now attached to it. Um, if we were following doing the tour in person, we would be moving past Chatsworth Wing um, and also moving past um, Bell Ringer's house, which is where the residential uh, nurses live on site, which has been the home to our residential nurses since 1933. Uh, the hospital was a rich... Um, so now we're at the front of the main building of the hospital, which is um, Melrose, um, Melrose Lodge. Um, this, this building, uh, so the hospital was originally set up by Andrew Reed in 1854 in the city of London. Um, and re sorry, um, sorry about that. Um, but so what I'm going to tell you now is a little bit about kind of the origins of the estate before the hospital moved in. So the house and the estate were originally developed in 1759 
when Miss Penelope, Penelope Pitt, Pitt uh, later Lord Lady Rivers, purchased nine fields south of West, West Hill and commissioned Lancelot Capability Brown to design a mansion and grounds. Brown was charged with building an elegant casino, um, which some more information about that would be fantastic. Um, <laughs> The, the estate was extens extensive, uh, 41 acres, and the original park featured an open landscape of grass and irregular scattered individual trees and a house farm. Little survives from the landscape today, but there's still evidence of some features such as the contouring um, of the site with its rolling hills and serpentine pathways and walks. In 1786, the mansion was demolished by its new owner, uh, Johanna um, Anthony Rucker, um, 1719 to 1804, a German expatriate from Hamburg. He commissioned Jesse Gibson, uh, a district surveyor from Hackney, to design a new house, creating a, a three-story mansion house with a front facade uh, facing westward. Um, and there is um, one of the an early picture of what the hospital would look like um, when they moved in before any extensions happened. Um, the, the new house, uh, West, West Hill or, or West Hill House, later to be known as Milrose Lodge, uh, was described by a contemporary, in a contemporary account as the following. This villa uh, is about five miles from London and is delightfully situated on on an eminence commanding the whole of the rich vale, which expands from London to Richmond. Part of the landscape is enlivened by the view of the Thames, and the whole is bounded by the hills of Surrey and Kent. The gardens, hot houses, pleasure grounds, and numerous accompaniments of the villa furnish a magnificent specimen of the degree of elegance and comfort enjoyed in English, by English merchants. Among the appendages of this place may be mentioned the farm, the dairy, the baths, and the boathouse, which have been much and deservedly admired. Uh, the house was later inherited by John Rucker's nephew, Daniel Rucker, uh, on his uncle's death in 1804. Uh, during his honeymoon in Scotland, Rucker met uh, Sir Walter Scott, and changed the name of the West Hill estate to Melrose in his honor. Um, Melrose Abbey was the former residence of Scott. Uh, Rucker was forced to sell the house when he was declared bankrupt and the house went through several owners, including John Augustus uh, Beaumont, uh, who at one point expanded the estate grounds to um, buy 263 acres. The hospital bought the building um, and 23 acres of land for 18,000 pounds in 1863, uh, which was the equivalent of a, a million pounds in today's money. As I mentioned earlier, the hospital was founded in 1854 and in the reception area, you can see a marble bust of our founder, um, Reverend Andrew Reed. Reed was a renowned public figure of his day as a prominent nonconformist uh, clergyman and philanthropist. Alongside this charity, he founded five charitable institutions, including the Asylum for Fatherless Children, um, Readham, and Apologies in Advance, uh, the Idiot Asylum in Ellswood, um, which again it was the Victorian's way of describing people with learning difficulties. Um, in the 19th century, there was the distinct lack of provision for people living with chronic and long-term disabilities. Uh, by the mid 19th century, there was increasing public support to address this and the hospital was part of that effort. One of the most high profile figures advocating for a new service to help disabled people was Charles Dickens in the mag uh, um, and he wrote in 1850 in the magazine Household World. Um, it is it is an extraordinary fact that among the innumerable medical charities with which this country abounds, there is not one for the help of those who of all others most require uh, succor and who must die and do die in thousands, neglected and unaided. The need for such an institution came to the attention of Reverend Andrew Reed, 
uh, clergyman and philanthropist, uh, which we've already established. Um, he set about his abundant energies to establishing a home for the incurables. And on the 31st of July, 1854, the Royal Hospital for Incurables was founded at Mansion House, uh, chaired by the Lord Mayor of London. The enterprise already had a number of affluent and powerful backers, and later that year had already established a premise for the hospital in Carshelton in Surrey, with the first patient admitted in March the following year. The early uh, premise, premises rapidly became too limited, and plans were already underway in 1856 to move to a new premise. Initially, the hospital moved to Putney House, uh, a spacious mansion on the Richmond Road, now Upper Richmond Road, um, which was the hospital's home before moving to its current premises, Merrow's House, in 1863. Um, just quickly in passing, uh, the reception area here um, remains, I, I, well, Previously, I would say remains uh, unchanged, but there was a bit of a redesign um, last year. Um, but you can still see the original features from this postcard, um, this photograph taken well over 100 years ago. Um, for example, the Ionic uh, pilasters are original features, and uh, the Georgian house would al also included the relief friezes, which you can still see in the picture. Uh, depicting class classical mythical scenes and statues within the side niches of which uh, the Andrew Reed uh, bust is one. Uh, I'm, we're now going to, uh, if we were in the hospital, turn left um, and into uh, what would have been uh, the um, north wing extension. Um, so throughout the early history of the, um, of the hospital, there was a great deal of pressure to increase capacity, and this was fueled uh, its early nomadic existence, uh, which was three homes in nine years, and, 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 continue, and continuing building work. The hospital decided it's, it needed to up its capacity by 100 beds to double its intake. In 1879, the Prince of Wales laid the foundation stone for the building of the new wing, which included an, an assembly room, lifts initially hand cranked before 1909, which I think you can see, oh no, this picture is 1910 when they were electrified, but initially it was just completely hand cranked, which is just, yeah, the, the yeah, the physical work needed <laughs> was remarkable. Um, um, the extension provided an estimated space for 100 new patients and also provided accommodation for staff and storage space below. Um, although, um, as you can see in the next slide, um, the, uh, the pavilion plan form was often used in general, um, general hospitals in 19th century. Um, as you can see, the actual design of the hospital actually took um, a, a corridor plan uh, with the extensions being built by W.T. Griffiths uh, for the hospital. Um, and this was actually kind of became, the corridor plan became more dominant uh, fr from the early part of the 19th century with small side wards from um, branching off from the corridor. So the, uh, the design differed from general hospital wards of, of the day where wards could house 30 beds in favor of smaller, more homely wards with a maximum of an eight bed ward. Uh, the wing was also designed with a, with a spine corridor, which is an important and significant feature of the character of the, of the wing. The need to accommodate convalescents also led to the provision of day rooms, sitting rooms, verandas, and the assembly room. So we're now going to go down the corridor of the new wing. Um, 
Uh, before moving down the corridor, it looks like we have encountered a furry friend. Um, sorry, it's a bit choose your own adventure. Um, so uh, here we have we have Socks. Uh, Socks is the hospital cat. He has been here for a few years and is a rescue cat from Battersea and provides comfort to patients and staff depending on his mood. Um, he, yeah, we, we don't get on, it's fine. Um, cool. So um, our first port of call um, after the encounter with the cat is, is the Delancey Low Room which is the first uh, function room uh, we reach um, on the new wing extension. Uh, the room itself was actually not part of the original design. It was a later added on in 1909. Um, the Delancey Low Room is a spacious multi-purpose room, um, which was built on the proceeds of a donation by uh, Anna Louisa Russell uh, Welbo Sidthorpe, uh, pictured here, uh, who named the room in memory of her first husband, Edward Delancey Lowe, who had died in 1880. Uh, Delancey Lowe had had a distinguished uh, military career in India. Um, and that's all I can say about his military career. But there is more information if you'd like after the talk. Um, the room initially was a women only sitting room. The hospital until the mid 20th century was uh, segregated between the sexes uh, within the kind of the convalescent rooms uh, with women usually making up around two thirds of the patients. Um, with the men at, at the time had that a separate day room, which was called the Andrew, uh, the, the Andrew, um, the Andrews room, sorry, I, I have the, named after Frederick Andrews, who was, who was a long running secretary. Um, and in that they actually had a billiards room, um, although the men um, spent most of their time just, yeah, smoking and playing billiards, uh, whilst the women were a little bit more in, industrious with their crafts. Um, the typical daily routine for the Victorian and Ed, Edwardian hospital was to bring down the patients uh, to the day rooms if they were not bed bound. Um, so in this picture here, you have from um, 1907, um, it's quite typical of kind of the patients who were at the hospital. Even back then, uh, majority of the patients were in uh, wheelchairs or uh, carriages. Um, I would like to uh, now sort of read out uh, a, um, a section from a Christmas appeal from that, that time, uh, which describes this, the routine, the daily routine. Um, later on, um, so in this Christmas appeal, it's from a patient's perspective. It's unlikely that it was written by a patient, probably the secretary of the hospital of what it's like to join uh, the Royal Hospital for Incurables. So this is the patient's first day and they, they, they make their debut. Uh, later on, I made my debut amongst the general company. By this, I mean the patients who can leave their beds and rooms and was allotted my place amongst them. Never shall I forget this. I was afraid to lift my eyes and surrounded by sufferers, su sufferers and yet amongst it all, such brave hearts and cheerful faces and so few allusions to torturing complaints. I was much impressed by the wheelchairs. It seemed nothing but wheels at first. Um, and here is another picture from uh, 1946 of patients outside um, in the, by the veranda. Um, before our, our next, um, Des for, before we reach our next destination, I would like to point out the stained glass windows in this stairwell uh, next to the Delancey Low Room. These were an original feature of the new wing exten extension. Um, and uh, there are another set of um, 
stained glass windows on the other side um, of the assembly room, which is the next room along. Um, these used to be the only existing uh, Victorian stained glass left remaining in the original build of the hospital. Um, however, the assembly room has recently had its own stained glass restored. Uh, so I will speak about that later. However, uh, before we move on, I would also like to mention that these windows were in fact featured in the music video for uh, the Irish boy band Westlife's top 10 hit, Safe, in 2010. So, um, yeah, just you, you can find that on YouTube and uh, they, they, they go around the hospital and at one point they're on the roof. So th there's some, some nice, um, very complimentary to the tour, a virtual tour of the um, hospital. So our next um, destination is the assembly room. Uh, the assembly room is um, the grandest room in the hospital, uh, which might not be able, very apparent from that black and white picture. Um, the room was originally designed, I'll just pop to this one. Uh, the room was originally designed as a day room for uh, female patients, but later used as a day room for both men and women. The first stone of the new extension was laid by um, His Royal, Royal Highness uh, Ed, Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, later Edward VII, on the 7th of July, 1879. The room also serves as a religious space for the hospital. In 1911, a fine organ was presented for use um, um, by, the, for, by the church congregation, um, replacing an earlier organ, which was there. Um, and this, the 1911 organ stayed in place until the 1970s. In 2018, the hospital successfully funded for the restoration of the assembly room Victorian windows. Uh, the money, uh, the hospital um, managed to raise over, well, uh, raised the figure of £100,000 um, to replace the frames and the plain glass sections of the windows. Um, these windows were damaged during the Second World War uh, when the uh, windows were blown out during an air raid during the Blitz. Uh, the hospital was fortunate to survive any uh, severe damage um, during the war, um, having also been directly hit in 1944 um, by um, many incendiary bombs. Uh, so it is, it's, it's very impressive that there was kind of like, there was no damage. And also fortunately, um, no patients or staff were lost during the war, uh, with many of the patients having been evacuated to Scotland um, or um, sent home to live with families um, rather than stay in Putney, which uh, did receive um, considerable bombardment. Um, it's quite interesting in terms of anecdotally of kind of some of the nursing staff having to, um, cons after their um, after work, would be doing air, air, work, air raids um, they were also air raid wardens on the roof. Um, so as well as doing their shift, they would then go up on the roofs to make sure that there was no, um, to reduce bomb down, um, potential fires. Um, we're now going to move on uh, to the end of the corridor. And this, before we um, move on to the Alexandra wing, we're in the last uh, section of the hospital uh, which was extended prior to the 1970s. Uh, this area uh, where we would be standing uh, is called the uh, Restor uh, Wing uh, and it was funded again by uh, funded by the will of T.M. Westall um, Esquire and increased capacity by providing um, an additional 28 beds. Um, the facade of the Westall Wing is facing West Hill, uh, giving a three-story uh, pedimented elevation with engaged giant ionic columns, uh, which echoed the whole uh, 
northern elevation of the hospital and provided the hospital with symmetry and unity despite its piecemeal construction. One of the things which makes the RHN unique um, is the number of different services available on site. Uh, the RHN provides physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language uh, therapy, podiatry and dental services on site in Putney. This means that patients do not have to be transferred to external providers for care, and can, uh, which can be disruptive and time consuming for patients. It also ensures a, a continuity as the interdisciplinary team are able to take a holistic view on patient care. Um, where we would be standing um, now at the end of the corridor is the occupational ther therapy art room, which opened in 2012. Uh, patients can access the art room as either, either for a leisure activity or a way to reach rehabilitation goals. The art room has enhanced facilities and resources designed to support the complex needs of our patients. This includes height adjustable tables and adaptive equipment such as mouth painting brushes, a mobile arm support and touchscreen computers. A range of activities and art forms are accessible from the painting and pottery uh, to digital media. Patients can work on specific physical movements and cognitive skills. For example, strengthening muscles um, of the upper limbs um, by modeling clay or increasing attention on an art activity in a busy group setting. During the recent pandemic, it was not possible to provide patients uh, with group activities when the hospital was in a state of lockdown. One of the ways in which the hospital staff adapted to provide some relief from the tedium and stress of lockdown was to bring the art project to the wards. One example um, of this was, uh, was providing patients and staff with clay to model figures relating to their experience of lockdown and COVID. Uh, so you have um, some examples here and you can see um, well, you can see the representations of wheelchairs, which is um, to be expected with 98% of our patients in wheelchairs. Um, but also I'm led to believe there's also um, people in masks and um, one of the contributions also had someone on an exotic island. Um, and I, we are currently kind of working together with uh, the occupational art team also to sort of create uh, tiles relating to kind of uh, the experience of COVID in terms of what that experience is. Um, and it's quite interesting some of the results uh, with uh, one tile being quite three dimensional, uh, but quite affecting because it's it just shows two clay people hugging and another where it's kind of um, really intricate of a cave uh, with the cave symbolizing COVID and then sort of, you know, it, it's a bit like Plato's cave with, with COVID. Um, yeah. So uh, we now will be turning into the Alexandra wing, which was originally constructed in 1980 to accommodate the research and rehabilitation departments. Uh, the wing was named after Princess um, Alexandra, who opened it in, on the 11th of December 1980 and provided a new base for therapy facilities, including a hydrotherapy pool. Uh, we're quite fortunate that we recently digitized um, that event. We originally, sorry, that would be impressive. We recently digitized a film, a, a real to real film of that event, which is um, has been digitized and will be uploaded. Um, onto our YouTube channel in the future. Unfortunately, there's no sound, but we do have other films which do include sound, um, including uh, what I hope to share later on with you, um, a 1974 uh, information film about the work of the hospital. Uh, the wing includes um, the recreation and leisure services, which provide a broad spectrum of tailored activities for our service users. Uh, these include um, the Bokia Club, aquability sessions in our on-site pool, uh, massage services, uh, outdoor trips and open leisure and entertainment services. 
uh, such as an audio library. Um, Bokia is similar to Bowls, but you can play it by people with severe uh, disabilities. Um, I'd like to now kind of briefly kind of segue into kind of what um, the wards are now and uh, what they were in the past. So there are currently 12 wards at the hospital, uh, two for the brain injury service and nine for the specialist nursing care, uh, including two wards uh, with, uh, for ventilator units. Uh, wards are typically named after a pat pat patron or donor, such as the recently named ward uh, Leo Leonara, uh, after our president uh, Leonara, uh, Countess of Litchfield, or Haberdash's house, uh, which is the name of the transitional living unit, which was created in 1992, uh, funded by the Worshipful Company of Haberdashers. Some of the wards uh, named uh, go back much further uh, in time, uh, such as Ch the Chatsworth Wing, uh, which was named after Chatsworth House uh, in honour of the 11th Duke of Devonshire, who served as president of the hospital from 80... Uh, from 1954 to 1991. Uh, whilst another Coombs Ward could possibly be named after an area at nearby in uh, New Malden, uh, but rather unfortunately, I have not been able to confirm that despite a rigorous search of the annual reports several times. Many of the wards um, have lost their original names and have now been renamed. But it's interesting to see uh, back in 1892, um, there were, based on uh, testimony from the secretary of the hospital, essentially our chief exec, to the House of Lords. Um, basically, there was uh, some complaints made about the hospital and the secretary went to the House of Lords to address them. And his performance was very bullish. He, he was quite adamant that there was nothing, there wasn't a problem with the hospital and, and basically uh, uh, defended um, the hospital against some of the criticisms. Um, so one of the things uh, he mentioned was that there were 15 wards, which is quite similar uh, to where we are now, but the way uh, these wards were organized uh, was through a divisional system um, of nurses uh, with the matron on uh, in sole charge of the nurses and underneath her five trained nurses who looked after the patients with assistant nurses and male attendants for the male patients um, with around 180 female patients to attend uh, it would have been three nurses uh, to attend uh, the corridors between 15 wards, which with each looking up uh, over 40 patients just on their own. By, uh, when it came to nighttime, uh, that went down to one nurse in charge of all the patients. Uh, to give that um, a bit of a uh, context, um, the hospital currently employs over 400 nurses and healthcare assistance for a similar number of patients. Uh, so that is quite a big change. Um, you can see the differences between uh, the early patient rooms and the rooms wards today. Um, so the early rooms were far more like uh, private home bedrooms. Uh, so lots of sort of trinkets uh, and um, ornaments, um, bird cages, um, were quite prominent uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, today's uh, wards, although um, for being far more uh, similar to a hospital due to the complicated needs of our patients, uh, in actual, in terms of privacy, um, our wards for the specialist nursing home um, actually provide individual rooms for our patients whilst back in um, back in the um, rural incurable days um, the best a patient could hope for is sharing with one other person um, um, but usually that could potentially be up to four to six people on a ward um, some of which 
uh, patients would have potentially uh, spend years, if not decades, with the, that same companion. So, um, yes, I see the time, and um, I would now would like to leave the hospital quite uh, quickly and get into the uh, garden spaces of um, the grounds. So, where immediately leaving the Alexandra Ward, uh, we get to the social work garden. This garden was the former site of the kitchen garden and is now used solely to support the patient's gardening activities, uh, which it has been uh, used for since the late 1980s. Um, here we have a gardening group which uh, would meet on Monday and Tuesday every week. Uh, activities were tailored to the patients depending on their interests and capabilities. Some of the uh, general tasks include watering the garden, whilst others patients help grow and maintain various flowers uh, or, uh, grown, or grow or harvest fruit and vegetables. Um, we also have next door to the, the social work garden is the sensory garden. And the sensory garden has um, some of the, uh, the flowers which it has um, are very much kind of chosen uh, for their ability to evoke you know, the senses through either touch, smell, um, or um, are visually arresting. So examples that we have are wisteria, uh, white iceberg roses, herbs such as lavender, mint, lemon balm, uh, centralina, thyme, and purple sage. And it's around this time on the tour that um, most people point out that that's not the case and um, you don't actually know what you're talking about when it comes to gardening um, and that's that's very true so <laughs> if there is anything on those pictures which were taken uh, yesterday which are just like that's not that um, I apologize I am not a gardener so um, fi our final destination is um, just outside uh, uh, Goodman House uh, so this here is the oldest living inhabitant on site. Uh, this is uh, the oak tree, uh, which has been, which is a listed uh, and listed oak tree, uh, which is registered as an ancient tree. And it is believed to be uh, well over 500 years old. Um, the work has, has been undertaken to support the trunk and deter animals nesting within the structure. Um, I was digging around for a bit more information about the oak tree and I found an article in the House magazine from November 1974 um, written by a Brian Boddington who suggested that due to the great girth um, of the tree he estimated that it was 783 years old uh, believing it started life in 1357 when the grounds were forests and parklands um, which sounded fantastic until I checked Brian's calculations and actually it would if uh, it was correct today it would be it, that would actually be 664 years old uh, so maybe take some of Brian's information with a pinch of salt um, now I would like to um, talk a little bit more about kind of um, the garden's history in uh, the hospital grounds. So as I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, Lancelot Capability Brown, the famous Georgian landscape gardener in 1760, originally designed the current landscape of the grounds and the original house. Uh, so the original features of the garden included uh, the landform, yeah, e.g. sort of like the rolling hills and formerly gravel path and serpentine pathways. Um, and I think uh, some of which, some of those characteristics survive today in the south and west of the site, but they're probably most easier to see from some of the old photos in our collection. So in terms of uh, the below picture here, that's from uh, the 1910s. It's a picture postcard of the hospital. Quite a number of picture postcards were produced of the hospital, uh, which 
are exciting and also readily available on eBay, uh, which is great to add to the collection. Uh, so this is actually um, an image of south of the um, the hospital, um, showing both sort of like the tree line, but also that those those rolling hills. And this would have um, this would have very much kind of extended beyond the current um, boundaries of the hospital. Um, also on the um, picture above, you can again see sort of like the landform. Um, this picture I think is actually very good at kind of showing um, those serpentine pathways, which snake down um, the hill um, at the back of the hospital. Um, I think it is also worth kind of reiterating that uh, the old estate used to be far bigger than it, it, it is now. Uh, so um, when it was occupied by the first Duke of Bridgewater in 1825, so that was the first person who bought it off Daniel Rucker in 1825, he purchased, in a, he additionally purchased 200 acres, which meant the total area of the site was 263 acres. For those who lived near the hospital, this meant it stretched down the south slope of the hill all the way to Wimbledon Park. Um, so quite, uh, <laughs> quite, quite a distance. Um, I would also uh, now quickly like to get on to uh, talking about another feature of the hospital uh, it, from, uh, from the past. So um, the hospital used to have a farmhouse. This was, as um, people who might remember, was part of the original um, Melrose estate um, to have a, a farmhouse involved. Um, the farmhouse actually operated at the hospital from 1930s onwards and would regularly produce fresh fruit and vegetable for the residents, uh, along with poultry and pigs. Um, it would also sell some of the produce um, in exchange for market vegetables and fruits for residents. Um, and as you can see from the uh, from the pictures, you can see some of, uh, say, some of the hot houses. Uh, on the other slide, uh, you can see um, the workhorse Mort Lake, which unfortunately seemingly had to occasionally go into the city where our offices were based until the 1940s and pick up uh, paperwork every couple of months, which is quite a mission. Um, there's also a Jack Russell, um, which looks a bit sad looking and I can't remember why. I think it might be a bit deaf um, and some pigs. Um, which I'm not sure if you can see over there, but there's a sign saying health hazard, um, avoid the pig swill bins, uh, which is a great addition to the archive. Um, I also wanted to quickly uh, point out this man here. It, that's John Thatcher, who was in place as the, the gardener at the RHN uh, for over 49 years uh, from 1862. Um, and there's a really great anecdote in this uh, appeal about the farm, where he once, in his early years, organised a prize fight on the grounds uh, between um, one of his uh, gardening assistants and a London lad, and uh, the, uh, the, the local boy won, hooray, and he won the purse, um, and nothing was mentioned again about that, but it was just like, um, just an, an interesting little anecdote about uh, fighting on the grounds. Um, finally, I also wanted to um, pick out uh, this donkey and donkey carriage, because again, it's um, interesting occupations which uh, occurred um, at the grounds in, in the history of the hospital. So um, several months ago, I got a Inquir inquiry about someone who was interested to know about their relative from uh, census information, which described their profession as donkey boy. And the hospital employed um, teenage boys to essentially drive uh, the donkeys, which um, 
would be used for recreational rides to Putney Heath uh, for paying patients, um, which uh, is something which went on from the early 20th century, I think until, um, well, at least until the 30s or 40s. I, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, the donkeys uh, ceased to be, and that was the end of that experiment. Um, finally, I would also mention the orchard, which uh, was part of the grounds. Um, this orchard, uh, actually, uh, the orchard and kitchen garden, well, the orchard had well over a thousand trees. So again, a very big uh, spacious uh, grounds, which, um, which I feel if you, if, you, if you aren't here, you would uh, potentially would not see. Um, there is a nice little quote from uh, a nurse who started in 1946 called Mary Dorney, uh, who described um, her, first impressions of the hospital grounds um, as when I first came here uh, there where the council flats are now uh, was the royal land sold to the council that time was a sight to behold white apple blossom and that where the some of the flats are horses were grazing uh, where the Chatsworth wing is trees rose bushes and flowers everywhere but now but how beautiful it all is today. Um, I am aware of the time and I think I'm going to have to unfortunately wrap it up now, uh, but thank you for spending um, the time uh, visiting virtually the RHM with me. I do hope you found it interesting, um, despite my poor timekeeping, uh, but do feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions on email or Twitter and also, I think we're going to try and keep questions open now and stop recording. So please do ask me your questions if you have any.